I've been to the top of the world. This is the view from the top of the world. These are the highest mountains on our planet reflected in the goggles of one of my colleagues. I'm really excited to be at the IMAX theatre today. And what I'm going to share with you next is a piece of video from the IMAX Everest film, which I'd encourage you to watch. It's the most successful large format production ever made. Before I play the clip, I want you to hold your breath. I want to see how many of you are still holding your breath at the end of it. There is a place that is above all others, a place where dreams are chased above the clouds, a place where only the strong and lucky survive. The top of the world where the wind is fiercest is a desolate, deathly place where humans cannot live. Every breath burns the lungs like cold fire. Many have died there on the mountain known as Everest. So why would anybody want to climb Everest? Well, some 6,000 ascents have been made, but over 250 people have died whilst trying to pursue this dream. So why would you do it? It gives you a death rate of about 4%. But well, of course, the most famous answer is Mallory, George Mallory. So it's a famous quote, he said, almost as a sort of retort to a New York Times reporter. He said, well, why do you do it? Because it's there. We went for a rather different reason. Um, and let me try and tease that through with you. Look at the person next to you. One of you will get cancer. 50% of people born in the UK after 1960 will get cancer and half of those will die from that cancer. Perhaps a lesser known statistic is that one in five of you will end up in intensive care. Being in intensive care is really tough on the body. Through the decades of research and advances in medicine, the mortality has come down from about 50%, which means you could flip a coin as to whether you were gonna leave, down to about 35%. But if you just spend a few seconds staring at that image, you can see that pretty much every system in the body has to be supported. I was really lucky that when I did my anaesthetics, I was working with a group at University College London who were really interested in why intensive care makes you sick. I mean, if you think about it, why do you die? you have cancer, why do you die? When you die of old age, what actually happens? When you have an overwhelming infection, why do you die? And one of the challenges in intensive care is that we get all of these people in there. And what we'd really like to do, to follow evidence-based medicine, is to do large-scale studies. And we want to compare this person with their clone. But that's impossible. When you turn up in intensive care, you don't know you're going to be there. So often we have no pre-existing information as to what your health was like. And as I've said, you could be there for different reasons. So we can't compare like with like. Once you're in there, it's pretty tough to turn around to your loved ones and say, I've got this great new experimental therapy. Do you mind if we have a go? Really tough. But one of the things that we saw was that Everybody who was in intensive care was struggling to breathe. If anyone did manage to hold their breath for that clip, it was only about a minute. But they were all suffering in intensive care from a lack of oxygen. And as I say, I was part of a group at University College London called the Centre for 
aviation, altitude, space, and extreme environment medicine. And our translational work looks at what can we learn from these extreme environments that we can take back to the critically ill. And the ideas and the themes I'm going to talk about today come from that group and its wider collaborators. So we came up with a plan. If everyone's suffering from a lack of oxygen when they're critically ill, and it's hard to investigate people when they're critically ill, how do we resolve that? So we thought we would take 200 perfectly normal people at the Science Museum helped us recruit them, and we were going to take them up a mountain to make them hypoxic to reduce the amount of oxygen. And then just to make sure that we were testing people on the limits of their, their physiological boundaries, we were going to stick them on an exercise bike until they collapsed. So we set up the Cordwell Extreme Everest Expedition. And we did thousands of experiments. The, the things I'm most important of are that most of us are still friends, number one. Number two, we placed 25 people successfully on the summit of Everest, and we brought them back safely. We set up the highest laboratory on Earth on the South Col, just under 8,000 meters high. And on the way back from the summit, we dropped our trousers in that hostile environment you saw. We stuck needles in each other's groins, and we took blood from deep within our femoral arteries so we could try and understand just how sick we were, probably in both senses. These are some of the results. Um, if you look at the light blue bars first, what that shows is that as you go in increasing altitude, as you move across the screen from left to right, the amount of oxygen in your arteries decreases. It's fairly, fairly obvious. If you look at the dark bars, that shows the actual oxygen content in your blood, which doesn't really fall until you get above 7,000 meters. So if you look at the yellow line, that shows that it's preserved until quite high. Yes, as any of you will know, if you've been to even moderate altitudes, your body starts suffering long before you reach those altitudes. So what's happening? Why can't we use this oxygen that's there? And how does that relate to being critically ill? Well, to understand that story, we have to go back to understand the story of life itself. This is a history of life on Earth. It starts four and a half billion years ago, and the blue bar shows you the level of oxygen in the atmosphere. And for most of our existence, there has been a tiny amount of oxygen, yet life evolved. About two and a half billion years ago, blue-green blue -green algae arrived, and they turned the carbon dioxide that was in the air into oxygen. And that created something called the Great Oxygenation Event. And it also led to the first mass extinction. So as the oxygen levels rose, all the anaerobic, mainly bacteria that were alive before then, died off. There was then a conflict between carbon dioxide and oxygen, but gradually the oxygen sinks on the planet filled up, and the oxygen levels rose. You can see that as you approach um, modern times, the oxygen levels went too high. And they only really returned to the levels we have today in a tiny fraction of Earth's history. And the Anthropocene barely figures on this, this particular graph. The other really important thing is if you look at the bacteria that's working alongside the blue-green algae, something quite remarkable happened. This bacteria was engulfed by another cell. Normally that kills the bacteria. But we did a deal. Our ancestors traded something. These bacteria went on to become mitochondria. Mitochondria are the key to life. They are the key to multicellular organisms. And what happened is, in evolutionary biology terms, we said, we are going to let you live inside us, and we will develop a heart and a lungs and a circulatory system to provide you with oxygen. And in return for that, you are going to give us energy, 
vast amounts of energy, seven or eight times more energy than was, you could create when you weren't using oxygen as a fuel source. So these mitochondria are the reason we're all here today. So if throughout most of our life, most of our existence as a, as a species, there hasn't been much oxygen, surely we should be adapted to that. Isn't that what sort of evolution tells us, is that we, we, we carry those traits forward? So again, to understand that, let's look at perhaps how other creatures deal with it. This is a reef shark developed about 200 million years ago, again, less oxygen. It's now living happily in the oceans, but it still faces times when there's less oxygen around. In the case of the reef shark, this happens primarily when it's stranded in a lagoon and the tide goes out. So how does it survive that? When some of us couldn't hold our breath for a minute, how does the reef shark stay there until the tide comes back in? The answer is fascinating, but it's actually quite simple. In, in essence, it turns off the production of protein, or at least it greatly reduces it. And proteins are what make you live. Everything you do involves a protein. Every thought you're having, every, every movement you make, um, every surge in blood sugar, all to do with proteins. So they turn off proteins. What happens with climbers? Well, you lose a lot of weight on it. I lost 22 kilos. I had 22 kilos to lose, so I had a great reserve. I'm ready to go up my next big mountain right now. <laughs> Dan lost a bit less, but he didn't have that much to lose. But what you see are two things. Firstly, you lose muscle over fat. Rather depressing, can't run high altitude boot camps. You lose muscle first. And you lose about 10% of your, of your weight. We lost 11% of our heart mass on Everest. That's quite scary. It took six months for it to come back. Why are we doing that? The answer is probably that we're trying to become more efficient. You reduce the distances between a capillary and a cell and the mitochondria. So you reduce the distance the oxygen has to travel to get to that powerhouse. You upregulate your proteins. You become more efficient with what you're doing. So what? You see exactly the same thing on people who are critically ill on intensive care. And in fact, they lose a large proportion of their muscle mass in the first few weeks of being sick. So their body senses that something's wrong, and it follows exactly the same processes. So how does this relate to oxygen? Well. When people are sick for decades as doctors, we've been trying to give them more oxygen because that's what they need, right? You can only hold your breath for about a minute. They need more oxygen. If you look at this graph here, it shows the percentage of sort of people surviving um, a treatment. In the control group, you don't do anything to them. So these are people in intensive care and you leave them alone. As I said, trials are difficult. If you look at the treatment group, the treatment here is oxygen. So the message from this is, if you give somebody oxygen, you kill them. Now, that can't be right, but there's a balance. So oxygen is both a vital gas that we all need to survive, and at the same time, a lethal toxin. And the thing that brings it all together, the thing that unites our evolutionary biology, our need for oxygen, and how we're all alive as multicellular organisms today are mitochondria. The more we learn about mitochondria, the more we understand their story with oxygen. They're also implicated probably in aging. They may be implicated in cancer, which is going to affect half of us in this room. The one thing they can't tell you, however, is why you would climb Everest. So this is the first picture I took on Everest on summit day, because you start at night, you put this mask on, you've got boots that are four sizes too big on, crampons on, you can't really see or hear or feel anything. You have to take about five to 10 breaths between each pace, even with supplementary oxygen. And then finally, daylight arrives. This is the shadow of the summit pyramid of Everest being cast hundreds of miles over to the horizon. 
So why climb Everest? This is another quote from George Mallory, perhaps a less well-known one, but I think a better one. So if you cannot understand that there's something in man which responds to the challenge of this mountain and goes out to meet it, that the struggle is the struggle for life itself, upward and forever upward, then you won't see why we go. What we get from this adventure is just sheer joy. And joy is, after all, the end of life. We do not live to eat and make money. We eat and make money to be able to enjoy life. That is what life means, and that is what life is for. Thank you very much.